Thank you all for joining us today. The webinar presentation will begin in a few moments. Just going to give the participants a few chance, uh, excuse me, a few opportunities to go ahead and join in. There's quite a few. Just a few more moments. All right, good day, everyone. My name is Shane Nicholas. I'm with TAPI. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar titled Data Driven Decision Making with Process Analytics Making Sense of Big Data in the Pulp and Paper Industry, sponsored by Trimble. Today's webinar has two presenters Lee Kinney with Trimble and Peter Hart with Westrock. This webinar aims to establish best practices for data driven decision making in the pulp and paper industry. Industry expert, Dr. Peter Hart, will guide you through managing data assets, classification, and organization, and teach you how to derive value from big data for problem solving, process improvement, chemical usage, and efficiency. The webinar will also discuss analysis methods and examine case examples from the industry textbook that Peter Hart is currently editing, titled Chemical Recovery in the Alkaline Pulping Processes, fourth edition. The webinar will explore how Trimble's Wedge data mining software improves industrial plant efficiency by digesting process data from multiple sources for analysis and diagnosis to undercover and suggest root causes and consequences of process events before they escalate into big problems. Lee Kinney has been the regional sales manager for Trimble Forestry for a year, specializing in industrial data analytics. She has an MBA in management and leadership and a dual bachelor's in humanities and mass communications. She has more than 20 years of experience working in the technology sector, providing business solutions from SAAS, ERP, networking, and telecommunications. Peter Hart is the Director of Research and Innovation at Westrock. He has been employed with Westrock for 29 years in various research, production, and engineering positions of increasing responsibility. Peter has published more than 100 peer-reviewed technical articles and edited and co-wrote three textbooks for TAPI. He has been a TAPI member since 1981 and served in leadership roles at both the University of Maine and Georgia Tech. He has been in the leadership ranks of both Southeastern and Gulf Coast local sections and served as chair of the Alkaline Pulping and Bleaching Committee in the Pulp Manufacturing Division. Peter has served on the Taffy Journal Editorial Board for about 20 years. He has also served on the Taffy Board of Directors. This presentation and its discussions will be held in compliance with Taffy's antitrust policy. Taffy's aim is to promote research and education and to arrange for the collection, dissemination, and interchange of technical concepts and information in fields of interest to its members. TAPI is not intended to and may not play any role in the competitive decisions of its members or their employers, or in any way restrict competition among companies. If you have questions throughout the webinar, please type them into the Q&A feature on your screen. We will address all questions at the end of the presentation. Today's webinar will be recorded. At the end of the webinar, the browser will prompt you to complete a brief survey. An email with the link to the recording a PDF copy of the presentation slides and PDF copies of the two Taffy Journal articles that will be referenced in this webinar will be sent to all registrants within the coming week. Without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our first presenter today, Lee Kinney. Thank you. I wanna thank everybody for joining us for today's webinar, Data Driven Decision Making. And um, it is sponsored by my company, Trimble, the company I work for, Trimble, and specifically our Wedge platform, for data analytics. And today we're so happy to have West Rock's Dr. Peter Hart to discuss best practices for data analysis. And he's going to give us some data, uh, valuable insight in overcoming common hurdle, hurdles in the data analysis process. And um, let's get started. So our reason for bringing you this webinar is because these days technology never stops and the data created is massive. So how do you get value from that data? You're getting in the pulp and paper industry, endless data. And this is an example of some of the data sources, infrared cameras, sensors, readings, measurements, and controllers. 
that data has very little value on its own. And in order to provide benefits from that data, it has to be stored. And sorry about my mouse. Leah, data you have to share your screen again. We're I'm not sharing my screen. Oh. Sorry, everybody. There we go. Here's my opening, opening screen. Can everybody see? Got it. Okay. So again, thanks for joining us. We've got 2.5 billion gigabytes of data created daily in the world. Data sources, um, as I mentioned, in the pulp and paper industry, data is constantly being collected. And these sources can create sometimes in, in one specific company, they're, they're looking at sometimes up to 3 trillion data bits a day. It's a large organization. So. so because this data is so massive and it's considered unstructured, it has little value on its own. In order to make sense of it, first it has to be stored in storage such as a data lake. Um, it requires data science expertise as well as specialized tools. And then I like to call it a library. You take metadata, add it to your data to provide context and hierarchy, allowing people to search and analyze the data after it's been cataloged. So typically skilled professionals such as data scientists, analysts and black belts and green belts do the data analysis. But with Wedge, I just want to mention, it's so intuitive that operators can use it as well. Oops, sorry. So Peter, this is um, where you're going to talk about some of the data uses in pulp and paper? Yes, ma'am. First of all, I wanna say I am a data user. I don't generate the programs. I want things to be uh, very intuitive. I get frustrated with systems that require a lot of effort to, to get things put together. But ideally I'd write things down on a piece of paper, chunk them out with a calculator and come out with an answer. But the data that we have today is so huge in the pulp and paper industry, we just can't do that. We have to use tools in order to, to make good decisions. Historically, uh, the paper industries had people that have served on a machine for multiple, multiple years, and they understand the interactions of that machine. Um, good examples in the paper mill, for instance, are uh, back when I started in the industry 30 years ago, people used to strive to be the pulp mill superintendent 15 years into their career. Uh, unfortunately, the paper industry had a huge gap in hiring uh, young professionals. And as a result, we have a lot of people with a significant amount of experience that are walking out the door every day in retirement. And we have a bunch of people that are fairly young and inexperienced in the paper industry that are rapidly stepping up into areas of, uh, of management and control. So that 15 year uh, superintendent now may be promoted to that position in three years and not have seen everything that goes on and not have a vast understanding. So we need better tools to help us make data driven decisions because we don't have the experience to make them uh, make them from experience. And these data tools can help us uh, significantly improve uh, cost, quality, and production. Uh, next slide, please, Lee. One of the areas that uh, big data is very useful is in the, the areas that I work in currently in research and development. Uh, we can take and uh, use big data to develop long-term correlations on specific grades and, and look at uh, analysis to determine what areas of the process are most important for that process. We can specifically run over multiple time frames, multiple runs, uh, semi-controlled experiments, or as, as controlled as a paper mill ever gets, uh, 
of uh, trying to isolate specific variables. And then over a, a year or two year study of doing this, we can pull all that data together and actually have a pretty good uh, design of experiments uh, performed over a couple of different years and, and pull that material all together. We have an excellent example in one of the papers that we're going to be sending you on determining uh, impacts of ZDT on uh, variables that impact ZDT on a paper web. And with that, we looked at long-term correlations over specific grades. We looked at controlled experiments where we tried to isolate specific things. And as a result, we were able to pull some, some good correlations together and to show that uh, certain things are extremely important, while other things that we thought initially might have been important weren't as important in the process. And it gave us a good, good understanding of how, how to improve uh, the properties on that paper machine. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Another area where we've uh, used uh, statistical data is uh, in process control. And this is a good example of uh, both the benefits of big data and some of the pitfalls of big data. One of the things that we do with uh, artificial intelligence programs, for instance, is we pull centerline data from the last uh, three or four runs that we did successfully. So when we're preparing to get on a specific grade, we can pull up uh, the information of how these runs were performed the last three times successfully. And that gives us an idea of how we should set up the machine to do another successful run. There has been a reported case where there was a misunderstanding between the mill personnel and uh, the uh, data analytics section where uh, what was determined as a good run and all of a sudden the centerline cases that were being pulled up were for the less than desirable runs and the system was telling us to, how to set up the machine to run poorly <laughs> and uh, you need to have some level of process understanding in order to uh, to determine what's right and what's wrong. It's important that you don't take the data analysis at face value. You have to, you have, to have some understanding of your process to do this. But when it's done right, you can get an idea, a better idea how to set the machine up, how it was set up the last several times. And as a result of controlling specific issues or areas that are the most important for that process, which your data analytics will describe for you, you can actually reduce your three sigma variability. And in many cases, you can do things like lower your basis weight, perhaps, and still meet uh, process specs. So you can run closer to targets, cl a little bit closer to your lower limit targets and save a significant amount of money for the mill. And you can produce a uh, paper that has less variability in it. And any time that you run completely stable is much better for everybody and everything concerned. So by using uh, these data analytic systems to target uh, important variables and pay less attention to the ones that uh, aren't as important, to center line your systems and to reduce your variability, uh, you end up significantly improving uh, your process and your final product as well. Also, it helps you uh, reduce reject also because you're running to a, to a much tighter specification system uh, and what staying within specifications. Next slide, please. Another area that's become significantly important and big data will help you with is sustainability. Uh, by using uh, big data systems, we can better identify long-term trends on things that we, uh, we didn't necessarily understand. A good example is uh, we're currently using uh, long, uh, big data analysis techniques to determine where sources of soda loss are in a mill. Um, this is a, the mills looking at these processes every day, they see little streams here, little streams there, they may chase one down. Uh, they, uh, But at the end of the day, they're still losing a significant amount of soda in the process, and they don't really know where it's going. By looking at long-term trends and where things 
where things are changing throughout their entire system, we're able to track down some of these issues over a long-term basis and determine where the important areas are to go focus on. A good example that we've had for years is looking at fiber loss in a mill. And uh, we had one paper mill superintendent that always used to dismiss his paper mill fiber loss as, oh, it's just thin. And yeah, it is thin. It it's, might be a, a tenth of a percent fiber in the water, but it's 35 million gallons a day. <laughs> and uh, at the end of the day, that's a significant amount of fiber that's going through. And by using these big data tools, we can show re repetitively that these are the areas that are important. The other thing that we can do as opposed to looking at raw material usage, uh, we can also look at improving operations around a specific unit uh, operation like a recovery boiler. And we're going to go into a specific example of that a little bit later, so I'll defer it to that. But as a result of paying attention to these things with data analysis and operating them on the best practices that we can, we can end up producing more electricity, uh, which from a sustainability perspective with black liquor being a green fuel is extremely important for a mill. And so sustainability and environmental controls have a big part of uh, to play with big data analysis. And we get new insights into how to run the mill by looking at these long-term trends and analysis and seeing what waveforms are specifically important for the mill. Next slide, please. We've done a series of uh, data analysis studies uh, using a uh, wedge program. One of the things that we've looked at and is another paper that we will send you is understanding the total cost of ownership. In this specific study, what we were looking at is uh, the impact of refiner plate life on the total cost of the mill. And we had plates that lasted significantly longer uh, periods of time, but cost more. We had cheaper plates that we had to replace more often. And that's a fairly straightforward trend. But when we started looking at the big data analysis, uh, some of the different types of plates that we were using in this showed significant impacts on the uh, basis weight on the paper machine, for instance. And we could, we could actually trend the changes that we were seeing on the paper machine and correlate that directly to the different plates that we were using on the refiners. And it changed the analysis of what the total cost of ownership was because of the changes in cost operation on the paper machine. And these were uh, organic changes. We made the changes in the refiners. We didn't tell the operators to go change the way they were running the machine. They just naturally changed. And uh, the data analysis was so fine that we could actually see differences between different shifts uh, some shifts were more progressive on the changes that they made versus others. So we could not only see changes associated with the operation of the paper machine due to the refiner plate changes, we could see changes correlating with shift to the refiner plate changes as well uh, and see the differences in how the different shifts actually ran the machine. As a result of this data, we were able to look at how the different shifts ran the machine and determined some best operating practices for those specific grades with those specific plates and level out the quality of production across the different shifts as well. Um, data, big data from a historian always looks at trends. And uh, that's the simplest and, and most common thing that we look at. We see trends, we use trends all the time. Um, typically we use trends that go back a, a few few hours, days, or weeks, because that's kind of what fits on the screen and what the pie data will pull out uh, in, an, in an easy manner. When you start looking at longer term trends, you get lost in the noise from outages, bad data sensors, things like that. And uh, you need data programs that help you uh, put things together and, and filter out the bad data in order to see the actual process variability around what you're looking at. Uh, another thing that uh, 
big data is good for is finding the origin of waveforms uh, in a couple of different ways. One is it specifically will find uh, points where you start having pulsation in a system or 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 something undesirable occurring. Uh, the other way is the origin of waveforms of what things are critically important. And the WEDGE program does an excellent job at looking at the different uh, uh, process inputs in giving you correlations telling you these are the important areas to look at. And using some process knowledge, you can filter out some of them. For instance, I'm looking at ZDT on the earlier example, and ZDT was actually the number one thing that came up as an important waveform. Well, you'd expect that. So you get to throw that one out and start looking at things that impact it. Uh, the other thing is uh, with big data, you can actually start developing models and predicting delays. For instance, if I have an upset in the way I'm running the D0 stage in the bleach plant, uh, how long does that take before that lower quality pulp hits the paper machine? And you can get develop delays naturally with some of these processes, or you can use a uh, uh, steady state models like digital twins, where you set up a model of the mill that gives similar projections to what actually happens in a mill. And if I make this change over here in the bleach plant, I make it in the model and it predicts what my steady state value is going to be later on in the process. So I have an idea how to control for that uh, change that's coming up. Um, those are some of the data analytics studies that that we've done over the years with various process tools. And again, we have the uh, prediction of center lining and how to how to set up a system to run uh, the next grade that's coming up. Next slide, please. Thank you. <clears throat> the, the one thing for a best practice that I have to stress is you need process knowledge. You can't just sit down, do a bunch of data correlations and determine that you've solved the problem. We have a, a good example where we had a paper mill that decided every single problem they've ever had was the result of the pulp mill and recovery, like most paper makers do. <laughs> and uh, they had they assigned a process engineer to take every single problem that they had in the last year and correlate it to every single uh, pie tag that was available for the pulp mill and recovery. And they came up with some amazingly wild correlations uh, that just didn't mean anything. And we sat down with them for a week and went through all of the things that they highly correlated. And we threw out about 95% of them. There were a couple of things that they found from the back end that uh, could have significant impact on, on the front end. A good example on a system where we were looking at uh, at a specific uh, wearing is tool wear issue on the five on the paper machine, uh, the results of the final paper, we actually found a, a good correlation with the uh, amount of lime mud carryover in the white liquor. Uh, so something that happened all the way back in the liquor uh, clarification processes were impacting a, a final customer, but. Typically, when you find correlations that are that far isolated, you, you have to sit down and, and think about your process and try to understand uh, what's working with them. The other thing that you have to be careful of is if you're trying to control something and you're trying to correlate it to the controlled value, if you actually did a fairly decent job of controlling it, you won't see a correlation um, because you've made all these changes, but you control this value. So it doesn't change. And as a result, uh, you get a, you get a, you get an R squared of zero <laughs> when you do the analysis. So you have to actually pay attention to this and understand your processes. There will be times when, uh, when you can get absolutely wonderful uh, process correlations uh, and, and tie them together and, and solve some interesting problems. Uh, but you have to understand what's going on. The other thing is uh, these best practices tell you things that are important. And if your process knowledge says, yeah, I can see how that could possibly work. And then you start looking at these things. Um, 
you can start controlling the important variables and focus on those. And if you're routinely running these correlations and all of a sudden something pops up high on the correlation list that wasn't there, uh, that could be an indication that something is failing or something has has created a new problem for you. And it will flag a background issue or a problem that you weren't initially focused on. So big data uh, on a general usage can be very good at predicting the presence of problems coming up. Uh, it uh, can also identify key critical issues. Uh, on a different uh, machine strength issue, we were having uh, significant problems with uh, a divergence that we hadn't seen for years. And uh, when we were on specific grades, things were diverging in a way that just wasn't wasn't right. And it was creating uh, some significant uh, quality problems on the machine. And uh, we were looking at things, uh, trying to look at everything associated with it. We were checking process variables. And if you looked close enough, you could see that there were things changing around the refiners on the data analysis, but certain aspects of that data didn't correlate with what you would expect for those changes. And what we were finding is the DCS was reporting uh, energy power changes and plate setting changes on a refiner, but in the field, that refiner shaft was spalled and the, and the refiner plate was fused in place. And as a result, it was significantly over refining on that one refiner. And it took a very long time to find it. And, and understanding what you should see and why you weren't seeing that with big data uh, was, uh, was critical to understanding that issue and solving, solving that problem. Um, so you can identify critical issues and you can see what things are important on the machine. Also, um, using big data analysis techniques, if you have things that you can pull together good uh, in a rapid manner, uh, you can use big data for your morning reports. Uh, we, we had a mill that uh, had a morning meeting at nine o'clock and they talked about what they thought was the problems for the last 24 hours and what they needed to do for the next 24 hours. And around noon, they'd get the actual data uh, that uh, uh, because it took them that long to correlate everything and get it all printed up and, and submitted. Uh, we put in a, a data analytics system, we put in a wedge system in the mill, and the operator that, uh, or the engineer that was responsible for pulling all that data every morning was now able to have it by 8.30 and have it in everybody's hands for the nine o'clock morning meeting. And the, instead of working on the fields and hearsays, they had the actual data in hand to make the decisions for what happened the night before and what they wanted to do the next day. And as a result, uh, that improved the communications that uh, were happening in the mill. And uh, sorry, we were, we were able oh. to. <laughs> sorry, we were able to uh, improve uh, decision making on what we wanted to do. Uh, if you can go to the next uh, slide now. <laughs> all right. Sorry about that. Not, not a problem at all. So this is oh. me. Um, Peter, you are going to dive into some specific applications with examples from this textbook. And I just wanted to talk about it real quick. So this is not a textbook that is used in universities. This is actually used by people who come into the pulp and paper industry for their jobs. Is that correct? Yes. And what is, um, where is this going to be available? Are they going to buy it in a bookstore, Tappy, or... This is available through Tappy Bookstore, and uh, it will its first release will be at the Tappy Peers Conference next week. Uh, we're having a book signing on Monday uh, for those that would like to get a copy, and uh, it's just coming out. So supposedly, it's being delivered today at the uh, conference center for the uh, Peers Conference next week. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I look forward to looking at some of the examples you have here. So let me go to the next slide. So Something. you mentioned, oh, sorry. No, okay. You mentioned some specific applications and I, I know that we had talked about delays, capacities and trends. So 
could you, um, are you, is this slide going to help you with that or do I go yeah. to the next one? Yeah, we can talk, to, talk through this one. Some of the trends that are kind of interesting, I talked uh, for an instance about uh, controlled variables that aren't necessarily uh, showing uh, showing good correlations to things that we should see. For instance, an example that we're currently working on is we're looking at uh, COB values on paper as a function of the amount of size that we're seeing. And we're, we're not seeing a lot of uh, correlation in, with these results. And you would think that that should be because we're actually uh, targeting a COB value and we're putting size in to actually get that value. So there should be some level of correlation there. Some of the things that we can do with big data is we can look at the impact of total cationic charge on a system, and we can create a new variable with the data by adding together the, the size charge, uh, the amount of uh, cationic starts that we're putting in the system, and, and various other uh, strength aids that we're putting into the system, and try to correlate this as a function of the total cationic charge as opposed to just looking at the size and seeing if that's a problem. Um, so we can use uh, the centerline trends, as I talked about earlier, for controlling, uh, better controlling the process and leveling out what we do with the system. Uh, we can also use it to try to troubleshoot specific instances by looking at these trends and looking at the deviations in these values. And as a result of having the data capabilities where we can do some manipulation or, mo or mini modeling of the system, uh, we can get new insights into the system as well. Another area where this is important is looking at equipment capabilities. Um, over the years, this, the production of paper mills has, has crept up. We start off at a, at a certain size and that process at, capability changes over the years. And sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down. And as you start pushing these pieces of equipment to either low or high ends of their operating capabilities, their variability tends to increase. And by looking at data, uh, we're able to uh, better control some of these. A perfect example is a continuous digester that's designed for 1,000 tons a day. When you're trying to push it to 1,300 tons a day, you end up with uh, significant instabilities due to hydraulic limits and flow capability requirements and different temperature uh, requirements. And you end up impacting your washing uh, as a result of pushing the cooking zone down lower in the digester. And uh, that impacts how you run your brown stock washers. And by looking at the data and seeing the changes that you're getting there, you can predict changes that you can make to, to mitigate some of these process changes. On the other end of that, we had a mill where we shut down a paper machine and a digester that was nominally designed for 1,200 tons a day was suddenly running 600 tons a day. And it, the, the system really wasn't set up for that and we were getting significant amount of variability and by understanding what that variability is and we could look at key parameters to try to minimize that and look at parameters downstream to try to mitigate some of the problems associated with that another example where um, we have a, a good use of data analytics is understanding the delays that we have in our systems uh, we have multiple, multiple delay processes within the pulp and paper industry. We have things that can go for days, weeks, hours. A great example is we put a new feed system on a lime kiln. And uh, the system was taking about 12 to 14 hours for a change in the feed system to percolate entirely through the lime kiln. And we'd have operators on a 12 hour shift that would make three changes because they weren't seeing what they were getting. And then the next shift would come on and they wouldn't like where the system was set up. So they'd change their system. And then the change, first change the operator in the last shift made would come through and the operators would react to that change from what they just made. And they're four changes behind and they're trying to control the kiln from four changes behind. And as a result, the operator actions themselves 
created a significant um, a variability and instability in the kiln operation. And it took us uh, a significant amount of data analysis to show the operators what those changes were actually doing and correlating to, and to the fact that they had to wait for these systems to to stabilize and, and get a change through before they started making significant other changes, unless they had a good process knowledge of what they were seeing as the change started to come through, how they could make changes. So uh, these are some good examples that are discussed uh, in the book and in other places. Another example on the next slide, is uh, what happens with your black liquor going through the evaporators if you make a change in uh, your cost of sizing efficiency. And this is a this is a model example of changing the causticity of the mill from 81% to 80 to 78 and to 75%. When you make a change in your causticity, it has to percolate through your system and the black liquor feed uh, the amount of carbonate in the black liquor feed changes substantially, but it takes a significant amount of time for that system to percolate through the digester and come back through the brown stock washers and weak liquor tank to get to the evaporators. And as you can see here, you make a change and, and there's a, a five to 10 hour delay before you see anything at all happen. And, uh, by the time you see the effect of the entire change, in some instances, it's, it's 50, 55 hours later. Uh, so there's a significant dead time associated with some of these processes. And if you start making decisions too early on changes, you'll make erroneous decisions and you'll over control your process. Uh, this is one example. Another example uh, that we can talk about is shown in the next one. And this is a sustainability example where we're looking at the uh, uh, chemical recovery boiler. And historically, the paper mill has looked at chemical recovery as a recovery system to regenerate uh, green liquor to form white liquor and keep the liquor process running. As since uh, black liquor has been declared a carbon CO2 neutral fuel, there has been a significant push of reevaluating the purpose of the recovery boiler to not only recover chemicals, but to optimize the uh, production of high pressure steam for power generation so that we can get more green power. In many countries, uh, the government pays them a premium for producing green power and they get significant subsidies for enhancing the operation of their recovery boilers. And as a result of, of good data management and trying to operate the boiler closer to a traditional power boiler, as opposed to just a chemical recovery system, uh, we're able to significantly improve the power generation that we get from a recovery system. You still have to be sure that you keep the bottom of your boiler in reducing conditions so that you uh, get good uh, smelt uh, reduction and, and good chemical production out of the bottom of the boiler to keep your liquor cycle going. But there's been far more attention paid to the uh, back end operating temperature and the uh, control systems and optimizing a soot blowing as a, as, on an as-need basis as defined by the data, as opposed to operating soot blowers on a time-based system. And by doing good data analysis and, and good data measurement, it's uh, significantly important to be able to operate these uh, these systems. You can operate them sort of like a Yugo, or you can operate them sort of like a Ferrari. And if you're trying to go to the high performance systems, you need good data analysis and control. If you're trying to operate them like a Yugo, you can be fairly sloppy about it. But a good example is old systems are not, uh, old pulp mill recovery boilers are not sufficient to supply all the energy in the mill. Some of the modern pulp mill uh, boilers that are being built today have as much as 240% excess power being produced uh, for what's required to operate a pulp mill. And uh, 
a lot of that is around the optimization and improvement of smart sensors and control processes and understanding of how the boiler operates and use of digital twin systems where you can predict what a change will do to your boiler ahead of time uh, or artificial intelligence systems that give you some prediction as well. Uh, so basically, you need to stabilize the operation, you need to stabilize and control the black liquor solids, you have to optimize soot blowing based on data based analysis of when you need it, not just randomly blowing steam into the boiler. Uh, and you have to manage your, your water quality very carefully if you're operating at elevated uh, temperatures and pressures as well. So and real, real quick, Peter, I want to um, see your you you use artificial intelligence for the control loops and those are created in the manufacturer by the manufacturer correct yes Is that right? and then you create a digital twin that you set up which is a virtual diagram of what's going on correct yeah is it possible to run the analysis um say for instance you don't have a digital twin built on what's currently going on. Are you able to run an analysis without that? Or is there a way to do that? You can do it without the digital twin. The digital twin is one tool that can be used. There are other ways of doing it. Uh, analytics systems uh, are capable of doing this as well by identifying what the critical parameters are. And, and some of the center lining that we talked about on the paper machine can be done on the boiler as well. There are there are multiple ways of doing this. There's no one set of programs that, that does it all by any means. And there's no one set of programs that is a magic function for any of the, these different processes. Uh, it depends on what process you set up and are comfortable with using. <laughs> gotcha. Now, the way I understand it is, obviously I, I understand Wedge, but um, you can create a quick somewhat of a digital twin, but it's not a digital twin by just creating a quick diagram in wedge yes. and adding the param the the data tags that apply to that specific process you can do that fairly quickly and run an analysis does is that going to give you the same type of results that you would get with a digital twin similar yes okay great yes uh next slide please okay whoops this is me basically uh Summing up some of the data analysis methods, these big data tools, you can't do it in Excel. Excel is just not scalable. There's too much data. Uh, the data is not clean enough. Uh, when you're covering large scale systems, you have outages, you have bad data sens from sensors that have gone bad and Excel just can't do it. We've done this by hand with Excel in the past and we've had a team of four engineers take two weeks doing nothing but cleaning data in order to do some of this work. And we still had significant problems with crashing the Excel program just from too much data being involved in it. So uh, these aren't scalable, big data analysis is not scalable in things like Excel. You have to use some other system. Uh, some of the software that does make sense to use are the digital twins, as we talked about, where you have a model set up and it predicts what a change is going to happen. These have gotten better and more common since computing power has improved substantially. Uh, they're still not uh, highly used in a lot of applications because operators don't take the time to, to actually predict what their changes are going to be. They make a change and they see as opposed to running it. Earlier in the system, when we first started using digital twins, it took long enough to run them that oftentimes you'd, you'd put a proposed change in and you'd see it in the process about the same time your digital twin was telling you what to do as well. Uh, they've improved dramatically. Uh, they uh, they have a use and they do have uh, serve a good purpose in the industry. Artificial intelligence is a disappointment in the industry. It's getting better. Uh, when NASA first developed it, they predicted that basically everything in automation would be controlled by artificial intelligence by the 90s. And uh, we have not gotten anywhere near close to that yet. Uh, it's, it's a 
process that's still relatively in its infancy. It's getting better. Uh, typically, it's much more difficult to use than some of the data analytics systems because you don't have the capability of going in and changing the, the formulas and analysis and adding uh, tags in an easy manner to a lot of these systems. It oftentimes takes a significant time to do that. We, we were running... Uh, a paper machine uh, analysis problem with a digital twin and with the data analytics using a wedge process uh, on a machine. And we missed some several tags that were important. We were able to put those in wedge in 30 minutes and have an analysis. It took us two weeks to, to send it to the data center and get it installed and get it populated for the AI system to be able to do work with that. Uh, so that's something that's that's going on. And then there are analytical tools like Wedge, and uh, uh, Lee's, Lee's going to talk more about that in the next slide, I believe. Let's see, yes. Oh. So um, when we're talking about analytics tools, they they have to be visually intuitive. It has to be easy to use. And when you look at it, you have to be able to understand what's going on without digging too much. Um, Peter, we talk about um, digital twins, artificial intelligence, but when it comes to um, basic and advanced calculations, when you're in an analysis tool, how important is it to be able to go in and, and change your parameters? Like for instance, you set your center line up and something changes and you might have, it, not you specifically, but it might have been set up wrong. How easy is it to change that? or how important is it for it to be able to be changed quickly and easily? By being able to change it quickly and easily, you're able to continue your analysis. And, and oftentimes we set up an analysis using pie tags that we think are important. And we find that there are other things going on in the mill and we need to change what we're looking at or add or subtract to, to the system. Uh, sometimes it's uh, just something as simple as a data sensor has gone bad and we're producing bad results from that one, one system and we have to go find something else that works with it. And doing it quickly is uh, is important for troubleshooting analysis. Yeah, and I believe that Wedge has been able to do that as well, is that correct? Yes, I just talked about an example uh, on the paper machine where we did the comparison between Wedge and an AI system and we we're able to get things done in, in a short amount of time with Wedge, and it took a much longer time to get the AI system changed uh, for the same analysis. So I, I'm understanding that with the artificial intelligence system, it's great for automated systems, but things change a lot. So it, it, that's where it's running in the, in the shortfall? It seems to be at the moment, yes. Uh, it's getting better. Uh, but uh, it still has a long ways to go to, to be as useful as uh, and interactive as uh, the wedge system is for predicting what we're trying to do. The big thing about the wedge system is the importance of filtering data. Uh, paper mills produce tons and tons of data that are just bad. <laughs> we have sensors that are not calibrated, that have, uh, that have failed, and they're still generating points. Uh, one of the instances that we talked about that I talked about earlier where the paper uh, mill guy was correlating every pie tag at the back end of the mill. He got some correlations with tags that had been removed years, the sensor had been removed years ago, but the pie system was still randomly generating a point and, and he had correlations to those. And it's like, that hasn't been measured in five years. Wow. So, <laughs> uh, and it hit a correlation. So uh, understanding and filtering data is extremely important. And uh, that's one of the things that Wedge absolutely excels at. That's and awesome. uh, thank you. For sake of time, I think we need to move on. We're yes. kind of running out. <laughs> All right. So very quickly, um, Wedge, if you'd like to see more about it, I would love to um, talk to you about it. Wedge was built for um, powerful data sorting and cleaning. It's been around for over 30 years. It was actually initially developed as an artificial intelligence product but it doesn't work without process knowledge and it needs to have people who understand what correlations it's showing in order for it to run. Um, it's not magic 
typical data analytics looks at problems in a straight line. But as you can see here, we like this spaghetti bowl diagram to show how actual analytics goes. You're, you've got your hypothesis, you pull in your data thinking this is what you need, you find out you need more data. The beauty with Wedge is you don't have to go back to the beginning, start all over again, and you can just pick up where you left off. Wedge is great for identifying best correlations, origin of waveform, um, delay compensation, and allows you to do all this very quickly. We talked a lot about artificial intelligence, digital twins, and data analysis, and what parts they play in the role of doing your data analysis. Wedge is a bolt-on to allow you to do the diagnostics. And Peter mentioned the morning meeting, the morning report um, with regards to the frequency of data analysis. There are many ways, uh, many times in which you would use it. You don't want to only be solving problems that are coming up. You wanna be able to use it looking forward and making changes to your system. So continuous improvement people like to use it refining your product for quality control. There are so many different uses, Peter. Um, what, is you, what do you find to be the most common issue with uh, data analysis or in, the, in your process requiring data analysis? The biggest issue is filtering data. It, it, you generate tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of data points and uh, in that time frame, you you have uh, sensors that have gone bad. You have the sensors that have uh, drifted significantly. You have uh, shutdowns, uh, mill outages, uh, planned and unplanned, and all of those uh, things result in uh, in bad data. And you've got to be able to filter them out. Another thing is the capability of pulling out specific data. Uh, Oftentimes we're looking at the impact on a specific grade and we've run that grade multiple times over the year, uh, but uh, we need to be able to filter the data so that we're only pulling data sets from when those grades are being run. And uh, this is an example where Wedge is, is uh, head and shoulders above most of the other programs is it gives you the capability of pulling that data and putting a new data set together of just that uh, good data. It filters out the downtime, it filters out to significantly uh, bad points, and, and it collects multiple time frame data and, and filters out the, the material in between the sets that you're looking at and puts together a new set. It, it's very easy to do that, and that's a huge problem with data analysis. I think my favorite quote that I heard from one of your guys is, once you create your diagram, it's it it's so easy to use. It almost feels like cheating. Yes, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Let me go to the next slide. So, in summary, um, we talked about big data, the data sources, best practices, things to look out for. Um, we talked about Peter's book. We talked about Wedge as an analytics tool, and we went over some case examples. We're going to um, you will be sent. Uh, the recording of this, as well as the papers that we talked about. And um, I'm not sure, do we do the Q&A next or when does that come up? Or do we have time for it? Yes, thank you, Lee. We can go ahead and start the, um, the Q&A now if your presentation is done. Let me go ahead and just give my thanks to both you and Peter um, for the presentation today. Um, at this time, as we said, we'd like to go ahead and open up the discussion to any questions that the audience may have. I already see a couple, so thank you for your participation. Um, if you have any questions, please go ahead and type them into the Q&A feature on your screen now. I'll go ahead and stop for just a few moments um, to allow any additional questions to come in, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Just a few more moments. Okay, let me go ahead and start reading off these questions. Um, the first one that we have today from the audience is how do you define big data? Is it the size of the data set, the number of data sources, or something else? Uh, 
I would say that big data is a combination of all of those. Would you say that too, Peter? It's it's not yeah. just one. You've got all of your data sources providing trillions and trillions of points of data daily. So that's a lot of data, but then you also have multiple sources of data as well. Um, and typically we look at big data differently depending on what we're trying to do with it as well. Uh, one of the things that we do with these systems is when we run trials on a paper machine, for instance, a new chemical additive, we can use these programs to pick up uh, a couple of paper runs uh, of that grade of paper before we did the trial. Uh, we can isolate the trial data with all the different variables that are being recorded in the data historian around that. And then we can isolate a couple of runs after it as well. So the data set itself is relatively small. It's probably several thousand data points, uh, but uh, it's still looking at multiple sources in multiple time frames. And uh, basically, if it's going to be too complicated to put into an Excel spreadsheet just from a sheer size of it, it becomes a big data problem. And that's the size, the number of data points and the number of sources as well. It's a combination of both. Thank you. The next question that we have is what is a wedge system? Wedge is a process data analytics software built for, was originally built for the pulp and paper industry. Um, it is a system that works with all of the data sources that you have, your Pi system, your historians, or Aspen Tech, whatever your system might be. And it allows you to analyze those data sets easily and quickly. It's very intuitive and it's a process data analytics tool. Thank you. The next question, how do you build these digital twins? SME knowledge to forecast what important inputs drive the process. Yeah, um, oftentimes the digital twin will be something that the vendor offers for a specific piece of equipment and they have built it by what their understanding is. Other methods of doing it can be some of the general material and energy systems like wind gems out there where you have a specific process knowledge and you develop a process that mimics or simulates the process that you're actually running. Um, it depends on what level of uh, digital twin you're looking at. But mostly when we're talking about digital twins, it's it's a process control offering by uh, one of the major major vendors out there. So they're using their process knowledge and, and understanding of that system to, to sell you a control system, basically. All righty, thank you. We do have another question. How do you determine the time lag involved throughout various processes? Example from the liquor cycle bleaching PM to QC lab data. In some, Leah, Lee, do you have a? So how do you, how do you determine the lag? Yeah. So you can use Wedge to do that if you'd like. You can go in and factor in your delays because the data, the information of the lag lives within the data. And if you wanted to create that diagram of those different pieces, it will do the calculation for you. And it'll give you that information and then you can create that delay model. Peter, is there more to that as well that, that you would like to add? You can do, the systems will do that and do a very good job at predicting changes that it's seeing and when they can percolate through the system. Other things that you can do is you can actually watch it go through the system. As, as you make a change here, you can see that percolate through various process changes by looking at the, the data trends and following the process flow systems. In some instances, you can actually do some step change uh, modeling with the system where you purposely make a step change in the system and then follow it through the data trending and set your system up then to, uh, to put that type of lag into the uh, data analysis that you're doing. Uh, so 
the process, the programs itself will give you an idea of what they should be. And then you can actually go in and do some experimental work that you analyze with the data systems to help uh, fine tune the, system, the process. Thank you. We're about a minute out, but there is one more question. I'll try to squeeze it in. Um, what should be the data acquisition period to get the presented advantages? It depends on what you're specifically looking at. We've had very good success with troubleshooting, looking at things over the course of a few days or a week. Uh, we've done other troubleshooting data where we've looked at several months and we've done some work that has been spread over two or three years of, of data analysis. That's one of the huge advantages of using uh, big data systems is we have a tremendous amount of information locked into our data historians that cover years and we can look at long-term trends that we have never really looked at or seen before because we never had the data analytics power to do that and that gives us some interesting uh, interesting information as well thank you um, we did receive one more question, but we're at the 12 o'clock hour, so I will forward that to you all afterwards, if that's all right with you. Okay. Um, and there is a kind remark I want to go ahead and say from one of the uh, participants, and that's thanks and congratulations for the presentation. So I do want to make sure I get that in. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, thank you to our pre presenters, Lee Kenny, of course, and Peter Hart, and then to our sponsor, Trimble, for today's presentation. Um, again, a quick reminder to the audience, please stay online for a few moments after the webinar ends to complete the brief survey. We encourage you to complete the survey so that we can get proper feedback on how to better serve you in future presentations. Um, again, an email with the link to the recording, um, a PD PDF copy of the presentation slides and PDF copies of the two Tappy Journal articles uh, that were mentioned in this webinar will be sent to all registrants. So keep an eye out for that in the next coming week. Um, at this time, I'll go ahead and close. So thanks again to everyone, both our presenters and also our attendees. Um, this will conclude the webinar. Stay online and you will see that survey launch now. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Peter. Thank you.